All right, well, I'm going to dive right in today. Again, if we haven't met, my name is Josh. I want to say welcome to everybody, but we're going to jump right into our current series, Looking at the Life of Jesus. I'm in the book of Luke, about two-thirds of the way through your Bible, and uh, we're going to look at a story that we're picking up from last week, and it's an interesting story because in one minute, people are respecting Jesus for the wisdom and the authority that he has, and today, we're not going to see the respected Jesus, we're going to see the rejected Jesus, and how quickly people can turn on him. So check it out in Luke 4, verse 22, it says this, everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be, they asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? Jesus is in his hometown where he would have grown up as a boy, a town called Nazareth. Then he said, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Certainly there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He's saying Elijah was not sent to the Jewish people or to the Israelite people. He was not sent to any of them. He was instead sent to a foreigner, someone outside of the Jewish culture, of outside of the Jewish faith, a widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel also had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha. But the only one he healed was Naaman, a Syrian. Again, not a Jewish person, but someone outside of the Jewish faith. Someone that would have been referred to as a Gentile, which is you and I as well. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. And a parallel passage telling the same story in the book of Matthew chapter 13 says, and they took offense at him. They took offense at him. I was thinking about, uh, you know, right after college, living with a bunch of dudes before I got married, and guys just do weird stuff, you know? Some of you married one. And, um, and one of the things that would often happen in the little condo that we lived in is kind of wrestling matches would break out, and I don't know if it was competition or like, um, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was weird. Don't tell me if you think that's weird. But, and, and I remember wrestling with one of my friends, and I was beginning to lose the fight, believe it or not, and so I, I, I pulled out an old trick and I stuck my finger on the inside of his cheek and I made it into a fish hook and I pulled as hard as I could. And uh, I think that's actually called fish hooking. And uh, when you do that to somebody, you basically can uh, control what that person does. Like you have the upper hand. It's probably considered cheating, but it works. So. And uh, I was thinking about this idea of fish hooks and how some of you probably go fishing and when you fish and you get something on the line, you can direct where that thing goes. You reel it in, you direct what is happening uh, to whatever is on your line. And I was thinking about this situation that Jesus is in and uh, people becoming offended at him or people beginning to criticize who he is or criticize what he's teaching and how criticism like that happens so often in our lives, doesn't it? The question isn't, have you ever been offended or been criticized? The question is, have you been criticized yet today? <laughs> because it happens, it's relevant in all of our lives. And when we let criticism or offense settle into our heart or settle into our, our soul, into our being, that criticism and offense is like a fish hook that begins to direct the affairs of our life. Well, Josh, what are you talking about? Think about somebody who regularly criticizes you. And if you find yourself adapting around what you think that person will say about your life and you're no longer uh, moving your life forward based on what the Spirit is telling you to do because we're called to be governed by the Spirit, all of a sudden that critic becomes the fish hook in your heart that says, no, you should go this way. Or maybe you're offended at somebody and you're having a hard time getting over that offense. That person can become the fish hook in your heart or the filter over your eyes that you see all of life through. And all of a sudden, you and I are no longer being governed by the Spirit of God. We're being governed by offense or we're being governed by 
criticism. And in Jesus, in this moment in Jesus' life, it's people that only moments before seem to be amazed by him. And there's some of you that just moments ago, people were cheering for you as you made a decision to, to, to make an outward declaration of what God has done in your life. But I know some of you are going to go home to somebody who's going to criticize that decision. Maybe a picture is going to show up on Facebook and one of your friends or coworkers is going to criticize what just happened or disagree with what just happened in your life. And maybe they're not going to, you know, throw you off a cliff like they wanted to do to Jesus, but maybe they will begin to criticize you. Maybe they'll begin to say something that is uh, offensive to you. There's two reasons really that the, the people of Nazareth become critical of Jesus. One is that they say, you know, we've heard that you've done miracles before, so do miracles here for us. See, what we skipped over uh, from the beginning of, of the book of Luke to right now, what's not covered in Luke that's covered in some of the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John, is some of the stuff Jesus did in between that time. Like at this point, Jesus probably already would have stopped and had a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. At this point, Jesus would have probably already stopped and had a conversation with him, a Jewish man, talking to a Samaritan woman. It was controversial. It, it shouldn't have happened according to culture. By this time, a few of Jesus' disciples would, would already be following him. By this time, Jesus would have probably performed two miracles, both in Cana in the region of Galilee. One of those miracles would have been turning water into wine. And the other one would have been healing the family member of an official from a town called Capernaum. So Jesus gets, gets to Nazareth and everybody from his hometown says, all right, Messiah, okay, Savior, healer, if you are who they say you are, do a miracle. If you do a miracle, then we'll follow you. And they, they put Jesus on the spot and they're really saying like, Prove yourself to me. It's the equivalent of what you and I do when we say, God, if you will get me out of this speeding ticket, I will serve you for the rest of my life. God, if you do a miracle in this area, then I will follow you anywhere. It's this idea of, God, if you perform for me, then I will serve you. But following Jesus is the reverse of that. It's you are saved by grace through faith. Not through a sign, not through getting Jesus to perform for you. You are saved by grace through faith. What is faith? It's believing in that which you cannot see. It's, it's faith. And if you walk that journey of faith with Christ, he will reveal himself in your life. He will prove his word to you. But they became critical of Jesus because they wanted him to perform for them. They also became critical not only because Jesus wouldn't perform for them, but he kind of adds insult to injury. And he says, not only am I not going to do that, but I'm also going to teach you this challenging teaching that is going to challenge your Jewish culture. It's going to challenge the way you worship. It's going to step on your toes just a little bit. And he goes on this long conversation about how, how Elisha could have healed people uh, that were of the Jewish faith, or in Israel, but instead God sent him outside of Israel. Now listen, why would that have messed with these Jews that were in the synagogue in, in Nazareth on that day? Because from a young age, they had been raised to believe and understood that they were the chosen people. That the Jewish people were God's chosen people. And when a Messiah or a Savior came, he was going to be king of the Jews. He was going to save them. He was coming for the Jews. And Jesus challenges their faith by saying, not only did the Savior come for the Jewish people, but he also came for the Gentile. Now, if you don't know why that offended them, they were thinking about all these people that lived outside of their land that didn't live according to Jewish culture, that didn't follow the Torah or the commandments of Scripture, all these people that served pagan gods. And they said, what? The Savior is going to die for, or the Savior is going to come for them? They wouldn't have even talked to the Samaritan woman at the well, but Jesus says, I didn't just come for the Jew, I came for all mankind. I came for everyone, the Jew first and the Gentile. I came for all people. And they were offended. They wanted to throw him off a cliff. Augustine writes about, about this attitude that Jesus was facing during this discussion, and he says this, people love the truth, when it enlightens them. 
but they hate the truth when it accuses them. Isn't it true? You and I love the truth when it builds us up or when it gives us greater knowledge and understanding, but sometimes we push back or we resist the truth when it confronts our life, when it confronts our lifestyle. We don't love the truth when it accuses us and calls us to live differently. We don't like it so much that sometimes we take our lifestyle and try to adapt God's word around how we want to live rather than having God's word teach us how to live. That's how much sometimes we push back on the truth and we don't want to allow it to dictate to our lives or to teach us. And so this is the environment that Jesus is in. And so he says to the people, I know what you're gonna say to me. You're gonna say, if you're the healer, if you did what they, they're saying that you did in Cana and in Capernaum, if that's really who you are, then, then heal yourself. Do miracles here as you have in other places. And they're really saying, Jesus, prove your reputation. Leon Morris, one theologian, says it this way. He says, in this situation, the working of miracles or giving people the sign that they were looking for would have benefited Jesus in that moment by saving his reputation. Isn't that sometimes what it comes down to, that the moment that you and I are being criticized or we're offended, what are we most worried about? Not that our feelings are hurt, we're worried about our reputation. That Jesus could have responded, uh, he had the ability and the power to respond to preserve his own reputation, to defend himself. And maybe you've been in a situation like that where a criticism has come and you had the urge to defend yourself or the urge to, to justify yourself. We all probably respond to criticism a little bit differently. And I think if put in this situation that Jesus was in, many of us would have responded in different ways. See, some of us would have said, well, I am the Messiah, so you want a miracle? there's a miracle, now what? <laughs> out of pride or out of the desire to prove ourselves, we would win the battle and lose the war. And do you know why that would have been losing the war? Because Jesus would have caused people to follow him for what he can do for them rather than following him for who he was. They would have demanded another sign and another sign and it would have been all about what can I get from my faith? Following Jesus is about meeting someone that you desire to follow. Meeting someone that, that is, is able to, to change and transform you and, and following that person, not just following him for his blessing, but following him so that you might become like him. Maybe there's others of us that we wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't have performed for the people, but maybe you would have gotten defensive. Maybe you would have uh, immediately gotten uh, a, a list of people in Cana who, who saw you do the miracle and could verify that you did it and you could say, but I am the Messiah. I don't know why you guys are picking on me. I have all these witnesses. I can prove it to you. And, and you would have justified and, and defended yourself. But Jesus didn't do that. He just gave the teaching without becoming defensive. One, one saying that maybe you've heard before is this, that if you get defensive, the moment you get defensive, you lose. Because people can sense when you've gotten defensive. Maybe, maybe your response would not have been getting defensive or, or maybe it would not have been performing for people. Maybe your defense would have been falling victim to what people were saying. Maybe when people began to question you, you would have just kind of receded into yourself and not defended yourself and gone quiet and become the victim and let people just kind of dictate what was true. In fact, sometimes that goes so far in some of our lives that people start to criticize us and it immediately causes self-doubt. Right, you've been there? Somebody criticizes you and all of a sudden you're like, yeah, maybe they're right. I don't know if I am who I say. And what if Jesus had done that? I, he would have been like, I, I, I thought I did a miracle in Cana. Or I thought, I think I'm the Messiah. But he didn't do that. He didn't withdraw into himself. He didn't necessarily back down. He allowed his reputation to speak for itself. And there's many of us that give way to self-doubt the moment that somebody criticizes us. We begin to question ourself. But Jesus responded not by performing for them, not by becoming defensive, not by becoming their victim. He responded in a different way. 
And it's this principle or this truth that for a long time, Janae and I have said, you know what, this is going to be a principle that we're going to demonstrate in our own lives. This is something that we're going to cling to. Because I know for me and I know for you, there's going to come moments where people are going to criticize us. There's going to come moments where people are going to think the worst of us. There's going to come moments when people are going to question our motives. There's going to come moments where people don't have all the information, so they fill in the blanks. And we have a decision to make. We can doubt ourselves because of what people say. We can kind of recede into ourselves. We can fight and always have to tell our side of the story. Or we can make this decision. That no matter what people say, our character, our integrity, and our reputation at the end of the day, are going to stand up under trial. That our confidence isn't going to come in our ability to justify ourselves or tell the whole story. Sometimes, come on, when we get into these situations, sometimes we try to justify ourselves so much that we start to lie just to win the argument or just to make ourselves appear better than we actually are. But it takes a a sort of confidence to say, you know what, I'm just going to let it play out knowing that it's in God's hands. And to the best of my ability, I've done it right before God. I've tried to make this decision or live this way out of, with, with God's word in mind, with his direction in mind. And I've done my best to do it right before people, to be honest, to be transparent, to, to help people along. But at the end of the day, I can't fight every battle. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rely on the fact that my integrity is going to stand up in court. And that would be my prayer for you today. That you would live, you would strive to live according to God's word and his plan. That you'd live with integrity before people so that in the moment the accusation comes, you could say, you know what, I'm not even going to put a dog in that fight. Because my reputation is going to stand up. It's going to stand up under fire without me even saying a word. And that has served us well. And I think it'll serve you well. It It lines up with Philippians 2, verse 14, that says, Do everything without complaining or arguing. That's a challenge in and of itself, isn't it? Do everything without complaining or arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God. What does that mean, live clean, innocent lives? That means live to the best of your ability, live with integrity before God, and live with integrity before people, so when the accusation comes, they can't criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, and watch what the result will be. In this world that we live in, where everybody's criticizing and nobody can take any criticism, like it's open war on everybody else, but if somebody steps on your idea, But look what happens when you and I take this teachable kind of attitude and live clean, innocent lives. It says, you will shine like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Just because everybody else lies and justifies and fights and bickers and gives way to perversity and crookedness does not mean that you should. Because can I remind you that this journey of life is not a sprint, it is a marathon. And if you'll be faithful to God, even when it's difficult, then you're going to see his faithfulness back to you. So let me just give you, as I close, a a few questions to ask yourself the next time that you're on the receiving end of some criticism. The first question is this, where is this criticism coming from? Who is it coming from? Jesus handled criticism differently when it came from the crowd than he did when it came from his close inner circle. Think about it. Jesus is here teaching in the synagogue. People doggedly attack him and want to throw him off a cliff, and it says that he slips away. He doesn't try to defend himself to the crowd. He doesn't compromise his teaching so the crowd will back off. He just slips away. He inserted the truth, and he slipped away. Uh, um, In a totally different scenario, there's another story where the disciple Peter confronts Jesus over a truth that Jesus is saying. He confronts Jesus, and Jesus lovingly responds, get behind me, Satan. (laughs) I don't ever want Jesus to say that to me, like anything else, but not get behind me, Satan. And, And Jesus wasn't being condescending. He wasn't condemning Peter, but he was defining himself to Peter. See, now, now, 
living with humility and enduring criticism doesn't mean that you just become a doormat and get walked over either. And what Jesus does in this situation is he says, Peter, this is who I am. This is what I'm called to do. And you're being a stumbling block to me. Don't cross that line again. And when somebody's ragging on you and criticizing you and coming at you with the wrong motives, it's okay to look that person in the eye, to deny everything passive-aggressive North Dakota within you, (laughs) and to look that person in the eye and say, you know what? What you just said hurt me, or I don't appreciate that, and if you cross that line again, it's going to change our relationship. That's not a threat, it's just a truth. It's okay for you to tell people It's okay for you to say it when somebody crosses a line or when their criticism or or they've offended you and it hurts. It's okay for you to own that. In fact, it's when you do own it, it's actually you being honest in the relationship. Because sometimes we say, no, I'm fine. It's, It's fine. And you're lying. And you're not actually being honest in that relationship. And it's causing the relationship to suffer. It's okay for you to define yourself in the moments that criticism or offense gets to you. Where's this criticism coming from? Is it coming from the crowd or is it coming from my inner circle and how will I handle it? I have to make a decision about what I will do with what I just heard. And you make that decision based on this next question, what is the heart behind the criticism? What's the heart behind it? There's two kinds of criticism. One is negative criticism. We've candy-coated that with a new phrase called constructive criticism. But it's negative criticism. The other is oppositional criticism. There's some negative criticism in our lives that you and I would be wise to hear it and say, you know, that hurts, but I bet there's a little truth in there that I can apply to my life. Like, don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater because somebody said something to you that you didn't like. Because maybe it's true, and maybe it's actually going to help you by them being honest with you. So negative criticism, Proverbs speaks to constructive criticism, and it says this in Proverbs 15, 31, accepting constructive criticism makes you like the wise. Proverbs 25, 12, valid criticism is like gold. Proverbs 28, 23, honest criticism is greater than flattery. If somebody asks you, like, hey, speak into my life about something that I need to change, like, don't just flatter them and tell them that it's all okay. They want your honest criticism. That constructive criticism is gold. It's valid for another person because it can make each one of us better. How do you know the difference between negative criticism and oppositional? You have to judge the motive behind it and decide whether or not you're going to accept it. Here's oppositional criticism. There are some people that for some reason are just mean. And they're going to criticize you based on the way you are or the way you look or the way you act. And listen, can I just push it a little bit further? Sometimes you and I are really critical people without even saying a word. When you see people on the street, when you see people around you, is your first instinct to criticize Or is your first instinct to see the value in somebody? Because maybe you're here today and you're actually the critic. You're the one that has hooks in other people's hearts and you're yanking them around or you find yourself just being judgmental and critical. You know what that's often based in? How critical you are of yourself. So give yourself a break. Find the value in in who you are so that you can find the value in others and give them a break. See, sometimes it's, it's not that people are overly critical of us. Sometimes it's the fact that we ourselves are the critic. Oppositional criticism is some people that are hurt just say things that hurt other people. Sometimes people give oppositional criticism when they say something with the wrong motive or goal. They're trying to coerce you or convince you to do something. That's adversarial. It's oppositional. And we have to discern what is negative and what is oppositional, and it brings us to a chance to respond, to say, how will I, the third question, how will I respond to this criticism that I just received? You know how you know when you're criticized, right, or when you're offended? It's when you had a conversation with somebody three weeks ago, and you still in private are having that conversation with them, you're offended. (laughs) You feel criticized. 
It's when, when you're telling the story to somebody else about, about the situation that happened, you're like, and then I said to them, blah, 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 and they're like, did you actually say that? And you're like, no, but I thought it. <laughs> or I would. You're offended. That criticism has settled into your heart or into your mind, and you have a decision to make with that criticism. How will you respond to it? You can fight and defend yourself and justify yourself. One of the harshest truths that I was given when I started leading a church, this church, was somebody said, as a lead pastor, your life is just going to be taking it in the chin once in a while. I thought, well, not me. I'm the kid who, in junior high and high school, I died on every mountain. (laughs) I fought every fight. And really just coming to this realization that I don't always have to or get to tell my side of the story. And being okay with that, that my reputation and my integrity are going to stand up for me. And I think it's the same for you. That if you live right before God and right before people to the best of your ability, then your integrity will fight for you. Jesus' reputation fought for him. He died on a cross. He was spat on with nails in his hands and his feet, a crown of thorns on his head. They mocked him. But you know what he knew? God justifies me. Maybe, maybe he knew, maybe he didn't, that the moment he breathed his laugh, last breath, God would make a statement that that was his son. And God would justify him. And if you're struggling to forgive somebody or let go of offense or wrestling with a critical person, you just remember that God's on your team that is on your side, and in due time, he will fight for you. How will you respond? You can fight, you can defend, you can flight and be the victim or just recede away from the argument, or you can have faith. And you can say, in faith, I'm gonna gonna define myself in this conversation. In faith, I'm going to trust God with the result, even if I can't tell my side of the story. Before you stand, let me just give you one more thought because I think this is so critical to our lives in this area. One of the areas that we suffer so much as a society and in our marriages and in our families right now is our inability to receive criticism. We, we just don't have a teachable heart and a teachable spirit. And we get defensive. Somebody says something to you and they're talking and you're not listening, you're just creating your argument that you're going to spit back at them. (laughs) Or somebody says something to you that hurts a little bit and you just shut them down. We have no capacity for somebody to be able to give us truth in our lives and we suffer because other people see things that we don't. And it's hard, I get it. In that moment that you want to defend yourself, that you want to fight the fight, that you feel like you're being treated unfairly, But here's what you do. In the moment that you feel like defensiveness is starting to rise up, and I think this is critical because I think it rips at even our marriage relationships. The moment that defensiveness begins to rise up, it's your job to be the bigger person and to say, you know what? I could send a volley back that person's way and, and, you know, you cut me once, I'll cut you twice. But instead, here's a key in, in those tense moments. Instead of getting defensive, stop yourself, look at the other person, hear what they're saying, become the student in that conversation, and say, help me understand what you mean when you say that I'm blank. And just by not firing back at that person and saying, help me understand, and and approaching the conversation with teachability, you're going to diffuse the tension. And you might just be able to get it back to a conversation rather than two people punishing each other with criticism. Become the student and say, help me understand what it is that you're saying to me. Would you stand as we close today? Here's why this message is so important. And if you totally ignore it today, here's the risk. You'll let criticism get into your heart You'll let offense be something that you carry around and it will be cancer to your soul. It will eat you alive. It's often said that bitterness is drinking poison waiting for the other person to die. And we do that. It'll be cancer to your soul, cancer to your spirit. Emotionally, it'll rip you apart. And God's plan for your life is that you would be whole that you'd be made whole. God's plan for your life is that you would have life and life abundantly. 
So I want you just to think for a moment about the fish hooks. The person that offended you that one time. And now every time that subject gets talked about, that fish hook gets tugged on, you wince in pain. That, that person that's constantly critical of you, and every time you want to make a decision, they're in the back of your mind. What are they going to say? What are they going to think? How are they going to treat me? And they're yanking you a direction that you don't want to go. The fish hooks that have gotten into your soul, the, the Bible says don't even let the enemy get a, a foothold. And some of us have through bitterness and through offense. But the good news is, God is the great physician. Jesus is the healer. And today he brought a nice strong set of needle nose pliers to grab onto that fish hook in your heart. And it might hurt for you to say, God, I'm going to forgive that person and I'm going to let it go. It might be painful. And it might bleed a little. And it might not come out the first time you tug. But you know what happens. You take that hook out and there will be healing. There might be a scar, but at least it will be whole. So all across this place, with your eyes closed, if you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Josh, there's a fish, a fish hook in my heart of offense or of bitterness or of criticism, or Pastor Josh, I am the critic and I am constantly measuring other people. I'm constantly ripping other people down to make myself feel built up. And today you just want to say, Lord, that's me and I repent, I turn from that. Would you just lift your hand with mine? If any of this just applies to you and hits you, And then would you pray this way? Jesus, you're the great physician, and I ask that right now you'd come and remove the hooks from my heart and from my soul that have caused me pain, Lord, that have directed me in ways that I know I'm not supposed to go or keep pulling me back to the same argument and the same hurt, and round and round I go. God, I want to get off the merry-go-round of hurt today. So help me, God, to heal Lord, today I confess that I forgive that person who hurt me. God, that critic in my life, Lord, I forgive them. I'm going to have proper boundaries with them, but I forgive them. God, I let it go right now so that I might live and thrive. God, I'm the critic. Lord, change my thoughts to see people the way that you see them. To be one that takes fish hooks out of people heart, people's hearts, not putting them in. Father, today, change my heart and rebuild it to be like your heart. Instead of a judgmental eye, give me an eye of compassion. Instead of hurt and pain, God, would you bring restoration? Lord, I give you permission right now to do open heart surgery on me. Come on, all across this place, would you just think about somebody who's put a fish hook in your heart, and would you just forgive them? Just say, God, I let go. going to ask our prayer teams to come forward on the sides. We're going to close in a more traditional way today so that we can move uh, into the business meeting. But if you need prayer today, we're going to have staff that's available. We have prayer teams that are available. When Jesus healed people, he healed them from the inside out, not just on the outside. And I know today that God wants to heal. I can tell you incredible stories of healing and forgiveness that have taken place. But if there's a fish hook that's been in your heart, one of our prayer team members or our staff would love to pray with you. Caleb's going to come in just a moment, and he's going to dismiss us. But if you need to linger and have somebody pray for you, please take advantage of that, because I want you to walk out whole, not, not with fish hooks in your heart. Amen? Come on, if you believe it, say amen. amen. And can you do one more thing? There's sometimes that we thank God before the result has even happened, knowing that the moment that we give him thanks, the result is going to begin to happen. So can you just say, thank you, Jesus.
Can you praise him and thank him that it's already done, it's already finished. We're so glad you joined us today. Our hope is that you're challenged and encouraged by these teachings every week. We'd love to hear how God is using this ministry to change lives. Send us an email at mystory@goevangel.org. For more information about our church, check us out online at goevangel.org.